Spirit of the Lord is upon us, right? The Spirit of the living God is in this place. Have you come expectant of that? Every time the church gathers in agreement that the Spirit of God is moving and working, God blesses that agreement. And so I pray that you come expectant this morning. I feel it. I hope you do too. Welcome this morning, church. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Abigail Gaines. I feel really loud <laughs> if I haven't met you before. I, I get the gift of serving as a lead pastor here, and I hope I get to meet you personally very soon, maybe after the service this morning if I haven't already met you. Um, but what a difference a week makes. Hello for those of you who were here last week. It was 40 degrees hotter, and we were outside serving breakfast to the community. So God has a sense of humor, right? God's like, now that it's nice and cool and shady, I'm going to let you guys go inside. Uh, no, we had a great time at breakfast on the block uh, last Sunday. Thank you so much to all of you who came. You came with amazing food, amazing hospitality, and it was such a gift to be able to welcome those in our neighborhood and those in our community for a very generous and free breakfast. Thank you for braving the heat, and I know some of you did escape upstairs, and that was okay. We did give you permission to do that, but I know some of you stayed out there for a long time too, so I appreciate it. So this morning, we are beginning our descent in the book of James, okay? It's like when you are in a plane and you're about to touch down on the runway and you're just waiting to feel the wheels touch down. You know, you're like, any second now, we're kind of there, but the wheels aren't going to hit they're not going to hit the tarmac this morning. We're not going to fully touch down. But I promise you we're going to get really, really close. And then next week you're going to feel those wheels hit the ground. But before we jump in this morning, I've invited Liliana to read our passage in honor of, you know what? Shame on us for calling this her last Sunday, you guys. This is not her last Sunday. We're just going to take a little pause. We're going to see her soon, okay? But Liliana, this is always your church family. So in honor of this being um, one of the Sundays until the next Sunday that we see her, she's going to read our passage from the book of James this morning. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make them sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of, um, of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three, for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. All right, Liliana, thank you so much. Not the last time, but it will be the time before the next time. There you go. Uh, so we have, have spent the last 14 weeks kind of mining the depth of this ancient letter to the earliest Christian church. Just think about that for a moment. I mean, sometimes I try to imagine, do you ever just close your eyes and you try to imagine what must it have been like for this fledgling little group of Christ followers? I mean, here we are 2,000 years later living out this iteration of the church that is on the backs of like a hundred iterations that have gone before us, right? Each generation just builds off of the next generation of church. And here is the church in James with no role, role model, no extra biblical text to refer to, Right? This is long before Martin Luther had yet nailed his 95 theses to the castle church door, right? They have nothing to go off of. The only back 
that this fledgling group of Christ followers is standing on is Jesus. That's it. I mean, this group of Christ followers, they're about 30 years out or so from the death and resurrection of Jesus. And they're figuring out what it means to live as ambassadors and as citizens of the kind of kingdom, the kind of world that Jesus inaugurated, that Jesus got started. But they're struggling, right? It's kind of hard. It's hard for us now as the church with a lot of resources, with a lot of historical wisdom to go off of, I can only imagine how hard it was then. And so James, the brother of Jesus, remember the half-brother of Jesus, he's a first-hand witness of the testimony and of the life of his brother. And now he's stepping in with the church, and he's pushing this little newbie kind of fledgling community of Christ's followers towards spiritual maturity. He's encouraging them to accept that the way of Christ means that they're going to look and be a little bit different than the culture that they had been raised in, that the only culture that they knew. I mean, can you imagine anyone here, a first generation of this country? Anyone? Like you were born in a different country and now you live here. It's hard, right? You've got one foot in one culture And now you have another foot in another culture, and you're trying to figure out what it's like to be a part of these two cultures simultaneously. This church in James, they're the first generation. They're the first generation of the Christian church, and they're figuring it out. And it's hard. It's sacrificial. It's humbling. It's kind of like trying to learn an entirely new language, right? But what James is pushing for and what he's pushing them toward is really a reality that transcends the hard that they are experiencing, the difficult that they are going through. Because what is clear to James is that they are caught up in a much bigger story. And he has the vision to see this big story at work. And we remember that it's the story of real and abundant life. Again, we have 2,000s of years of church history to stand on that has encouraged that in us, right? But James is, is pushing them toward this story that they're a part of, that he has vision to see, but maybe they don't quite have the complete vision to see yet. But it's the story where mercy triumphs over judgment. It's the story where death is defeated once and for all, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus as far as the east is from the west, so far as he's taken our sin from us, right? James sees the big story. And so he's insisting that the church live as a kind of people that belong to a different kind of culture, a different kind of way, that they actually belong, that they reflect this story that they're a part of, so that heaven continues to break in through the power of the Holy Spirit, just like it did when his brother was there. Just like it did. And I believe that what he hits home in this passage that Liliana just read, thank you. I believe that it's the single greatest way we mature as people who are committed to heaven breaking in. It's the single greatest way we mature as people of this kind of kingdom. So who caught it? Who caught the dominant theme of this portion of scripture? you catch it now? (laughs) Pray. Prayer. It's listed in every single verse of this portion. Six times in six verses, he mentions prayer. So I'm a wordsmith. If you know that, if you know me, you know I'm a wordsmith. And what I want to do this morning is I want to work our way together through this passage. And I want to discover what God might want to say to us this morning. I'm just going to make some observations as we go. But we're going to pay attention to some of the words 
that he uses in this passage. We're going to do a little bit of word mining because I believe that the words that James uses in this passage, I think they really matter for the invitation that God might be giving to us today, okay? But first, in the spirit of this passage, let's go ahead and pray. Sound good? So Holy Spirit, your presence is welcome to come and to speak and to move. I ask God that you put your power on this message and that you give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying and doing in our midst today. God, there are things in our lives that only you can do. And so help us to yield our lives to you so that you can do what we can't do for ourselves. In your name, amen. So James, in this passage, he speaks to three kinds of circumstances, three kinds of people. And to all three of them, he gives the same counsel. And I want to tease this out a little bit. The first circumstance he speaks to is he says, is anyone among you in trouble? I didn't get that. There we go. Seth might need to help me if I'm delayed. (laughs) He says, is anyone in trouble? Now, that's kind of a rhetorical question, right? We know the answer to this. It's a literary device that he's using. This is a church we know is in trouble. He actually begins his letter, if you were with us at the beginning of this series, he begins his letter by saying, when you face trials of many kinds. So he's kind of coming back full circle, right? Because we know that they are facing trials of many kinds. And he asked this rhetorical question. And if you've been going through this series with us, you know that the Christian church is being oppressed at the time. They're kind of being taken advantage of. Some of them are being disenfranchised. Some of them are losing their assets. They're losing their land. They're struggling to get along with one another. That was an age-old thing too, I guess. And quite frankly, a lot of this is happening because they're following Jesus, because they're Christ followers. Arguably, this entire book is about encouraging the church to stand firm in the way of Jesus when things aren't going well, when trouble comes. So is anyone in trouble? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. A lot of people are in trouble. And I said we do a little bit of word mining today. A good translation for the word trouble here is to endure hardship. Endure hardship. So he's pretty much saying, is there anyone here where where life is just hard? You're just trudging through. You're enduring the hard. Years ago... um, back before children and all that kind of stuff, Jacob and I, we decided to take a backpacking trip around the UK. We started in London, we went up through Scotland, then we took a boat over to Ireland, went down through Wales, and then ended back up in England. And overall, it was a great trip. I mean, how can it not be a great trip when you're like young 20s, no kids, you know, (laughs) you're flexible, like that, that kind of stuff, right? But, but truthfully, it was, it was a really humble trip. At the time, we had very little means. We didn't have much money to spend on the trip. But we really, really wanted to take it, so we just decided we would make it work. We would skimp every single place that we possibly could. My brother-in-law at the time worked for an airline, and so we were able to get there for free flying on standby. So that was great. Um, We couldn't afford hostels or hotels, so we camped, and we carried everything that we had with us on our backs, including our tent and our our sleeping bags and all of that. We pretty much ate bread and, like, lunch meat the entire time for our meals, Um, and because of our slim resources, we could only use public transportation when it was absolutely essential, like if we had to take a train or a boat. And so what that meant was that we walked a lot. Like, I wish we had those, you know, Fitbits and stuff then. We were racking it up. Like, we walked a lot all the time, miles and miles every day. And what we came to discover is that the UK in the summer, it's really wet. It's really wet. So this is what we looked like most of the time, okay? There's my sweet, poor husband with a broken umbrella, a chintzy, like, 
a poncho, right, his pack on his back. This is how we were a lot of the time. I kid you not, there were times that we woke up to an inch of standing water in our tent. Like everything was soaked. And I remember at uh, one time needing to walk to the bus. And now, mind you, it rains a lot. Uh, we had a lot of muddy walks. But there was one time in particular that we needed to walk to a bus. And this was before, like, GPS and smartphones and all that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> and the only way we knew to get to the bus was through this particular pasture with this path. And when we got to the path, this is what it looked like, okay? And this is just a short, like, glimpse of it. This thing was long, and there was really no way around it. We had to go through it. And it was gross. I mean, it smelled like cow manure, I have to admit. I don't know what sheep and bunnies and all that kind of stuff were trouncing through there earlier that day. It smelled. It was muddy. It was messy. Our shoes and our socks were, were soaking wet. You know, it was gross. It was a challenging situation in the midst of an already challenging situation, okay? So why do I bring this up? Because when James asks, is anyone enduring hardship? I want you to get this kind of picture in your mind. They are trudging through thick mud. And they are in the midst of an already challenging situation. And it's messy. It's hard. It's gross sometimes, right? But as followers of Christ... There's nowhere else way to go. It's the only way to go to get where they need to go. And it's exhausting. Mentally, physically, spiritually, they're tired. During the pandemic, I became familiar with the language of languishing. Did anybody hear that word going around during the pandemic? Languishing. Um, languishing is the state of mental weariness that erodes our self-esteem, motivation, and sense of meaning. It's that feeling of like, meh, blah, right? That's languishing. It's the polar opposite of thriving. Did anybody else experience that during the pandemic? You're like, I'm exhausted today. Even though I, like, slept in late and I've only walked from, like, the couch to the kitchen, right? But for some reason, I'm tired. Like, just emotionally, spiritually, physically, I'm tired. You just felt blah, right? Unmotivated. You felt tired. Research suggests that when we're in a state of languishing, we're actually three times more likely to cut back on pro productivity and activity. It's, it's an actual thing, you guys. It's like been researched. It's a thing. And I'd like to suggest that James in this text is speaking to a spiritually languishing people, a people who are losing motivation, their souls are heavy, in the midst of trying to trust in a good God, they are struggling. And his advice, though, to the languishing people his advice to the burden heart, pray. It's pray. Commune with God. Turn your attention, turn your languishing hearts toward God. Pray. In the face of adversity, where they are being pressed on all sides, he doesn't like incite them or, or provoke them toward anger or retaliation, right? He doesn't just tell them to try to like, drown it out, tune it out, like hole up with Netflix, right? Instead, he says, no, turn that trouble toward Jesus. And he advocates for them to pray. Stay close to the vine. He advocates for their communion with God to go to him with their languishing hearts, right? So the second passage, or the second person that he speaks to. It's actually a big leap from the first group. In fact, this group is having the opposite experience of those who are languishing. He says, is anyone among you happy? And all the, you know, troubled people in the church go, ah, good for you. Like, right? You know, glad you're happy, right? Now we got to talk about the happy people. 
But interestingly, when you look into this word happy, we, are, we come to understand that he isn't just talking about some like external kind of happy, clappy, yay, everything in my life is going good, the sun is shining, the birds are, are dressing me, right? It's not because their paths are just smooth and dry while all the troubled people are having to take the muddy bog way, right? But rather, the Greek word here suggests this deep and inner kind of emotional state that's not dependent or contingent upon external circumstances. It's more like even though you have to walk through the messy mud, your heart is strong. You're not languishing. Your heart, it's abiding with God. It's strong. It's at at peace. There's this sense of calm and, and confidence in the midst of the heart, in the midst of the mess. So we actually see this same word that's used here for happy in Acts chapter 27. And the context of this is is really interesting. I think it really illuminates this word for us this morning. Because the Apostle Paul, he's essentially on a prison ship. And he's sailing to Rome because he needs to stand trial before Caesar. And he is with hundreds of other pilots on this prison ship. And the journey is not going well. It's anything but smooth. It is not going well because evidently the weather, if you look at chapter 27 in the book of Acts, the weather is really, really bad. It's super windy, the water is choppy, and we're told that every single day the weather is actually even getting worse. And so at one point, Paul even encourages the powers that be of the boat to go ahead and dock the ship and just wait it out. He's like, hey guys, this is not going good. In fact, he says, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to our shipping cargo and to our own lives. But we're told later that they don't listen to him. They decide just to keep going, which turned out to be a really poor decision. Because shortly thereafter, this fierce storm kicks up. It comes upon them. And scripture says that the winds were of hurricane force. And they're stuck. And so for days... They're doing everything that they can just to kind of keep this boat afloat and not die. It says they're throwing the cargo overboard. At one point, they even drop the anchor to kind of try to stabilize the ship and let it just be drugged by the wind, right? It says that they had gone days without food, but nothing was getting better. The situation was actually just getting worse. And the guys were pretty much confident that they were all going to die. In verse 20, it says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Yet, in the midst of this hardship, of being completely out of resources and options, an angel actually appears to Paul in a message of hope. And so after this happens, Paul gets up before the men, and he says, Men, first it's like, and I told you so, which I love as a parent, right? He says, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you and all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. This little phrase, take heart, it's actually the same word that James is using here for, is anyone happy? So maybe we could also read it as, Is anyone around you, like in the midst of the storm of life, is anyone feeling strong of heart? Another uh, another translation, instead of take heart, it says have courage. So you could also say, is anyone feeling courageous? Is anyone feeling strong of heart? James says, let them sing praise. 
Let them sing praise because they can see that God is still in control. In the midst of the heart, in the midst of the muddy bog, they know that God is guiding them and God is still in control. So let them turn their attention, turn their strong heart, turn their courage toward God and sing to him praise. Because it's grace that they have the vision to see that, right? And then Paul goes on to speak to a third kind of person. He asks, is anyone among you sick? Again, I think it's probably safe to assume that there are people in the Christian community there that are physically ill. And in spirit of, uh, again, word mining this morning, the word sick can be interpreted as sick, okay? It's pretty straightforward. Sick, is there anybody who is actually physically ill? But get this, not just a little, like, sniffle and a cough, like I just feel a little bit under the weather, I have a bad headache that hasn't gone away all day, right? No, this is, like, critically ill, This is like last day's ill, like out of options. We've run out of, you know, we've run out of road to walk on. We are at the end kind of sick. And so I want to offer that this question is actually not directed toward the sick person themselves, but more it's offered toward the community of faith that knows that there are very sick among them. Because for these particular sick people, the elders have been called to go to them. Now, if the elders have to go to them, then that implies that this person cannot get out of bed, that they are in bed, that they are so sick that they cannot get to the church, right? Their situation is dire. Additionally, the elders are to anoint that sick person with oil. Now, oil throughout scripture can mean a lot of different things. It has a few different meanings. But in this context, the oil is most likely a symbolic representation of consecration. Consecration is like setting the sick person apart for the healing of God. And so they are meant to go and anoint that person with oil as a symbolic way of saying, God, this person, I'm setting them apart for only you to tend to because we can't do anything else. We are out of resources. They are told to anoint this person in the name of the Lord because only God can heal this person. Only God can intervene. Any healing is due to God's power and action, not to any human effort. And so by anointing, they are symbolically setting this person aside for God's exclusive care and attention. And James, he contends that this kind of prayer offered in faith with this anointing of oil, that, that it offers two results. One result, he says, is that the sick person could be made well, is made well. They are actually physically healed. They are actually physically made well when the elders come and pray and say, okay, God, you got this, right? They're all yours, right? The second thing that could happen is it says that the Lord will raise them up, which means that they will receive a spiritual resurrection that is experienced on the other side of their physical death. So they could receive a physical healing, or they could be raised up with Christ. Now, you might be wondering, why the elders, right? Why did James say, like, it's got to be the elders? Why not anybody in the church? Certainly, we know from other parts of the New Testament that the ministry of the Holy Spirit, it's not just relegated to the pastors, the elders of the church, right? Right? I think, and I might be going out on a limb here with this. This is kind of my interpretation of it. But I think that James is trying to communicate something important about the expectation of the one who prays this kind of prayer. 
of the one who goes into this kind of space. Because in this context, the righteous person is the person who is completely committed to go- doing God's will by knowing God's heart. Say that again. The righteous person is the person who is completely committed to doing God's will by knowing God's heart. And he says that the prayers of this kind of person, they are powerful and they are effective. And so he says, so bring those people in. Bring those people in because their prayers are powerful and they're effective. And it's assumed that the elders, which in our modern day are the pastors, so here you go, they were the ones who had dedicated to pursuing this sort of righteousness, to doing God's will by knowing God's heart. They had committed their lives to that purpose. So James is like, call the ones who are committed to seeing clearly the heart of God and who will pray then in accordance with the will of God, which again was always to bring the sick person back to full and abundant life, whether on this side or of heaven or not, right? That's always God's will. Remember the two things that could happen. And these people would pray in accordance with the will of God. And the number one thing, James says, that seems to be a threat to righteousness is is, is to being able to do God's will because you know God's heart. He, He simply says is sin. It's sin. Sin gets in the way of us seeing God clearly. It dulls our sensitivity to being able to attune to what God is doing, right? Have you ever tried to drive in fog? Have you? Super stressful one, right? One time Jacob and I, we were coming down from Lake Arrowhead at night, and we got caught in this super dense cloud of fog. I mean, we could see like, you know, a foot in front of us. And it was kind of terrifying. It was super stressful. And we were like hugging that center line, you know, just looking for it. That's how we were like driving by that. Just, you know, lest we like fall off the cliff, right? You know that like there's nothing on the other side of some of that road. It was terrifying. And when we got out, we literally like had to pull over and just like, okay, take a breath before we, before we move on. We were so tense. We were so stressed out. In the life of a Christian, sin is like trying to stay on the road when you're caught in a really dense fog. It makes it very difficult to make out the way ahead of you, to make out where to go next. You find yourself just desperately trying not to drive off the cliff, right? It's exhausting. So James, he's like, Confess your sin. Get it out. Say it. Tell somebody. Clear the fog, right? Because James knows that unrepentant sin is the death. It's the enemy to a flourishing Christian community. It's a fog to it. It's completely counterintuitive to what it means for that community of people to be under the grace and liberation of a God who vigilantly sought to break the power of that fog, right? It's counterintuitive. And that's why churches spin, right, when people are caught in sin because they can't see what God is doing. They can't see clearly the way ahead of them. And then when we read further, almost out of nowhere, James then drops in this little anecdote about Elijah. I don't know if you could go back to that, Seth, about Elijah. And everybody's like, "Mm, it's kind of like out of left field, right? Like, where'd that come from? Like, are we supposed to remember, you know, this Old Testament history about Elijah? You know, is James just trying to teach us on crop yield or, like, weather systems? Like, what's James doing here? This little anecdote about Elijah gets, like, dropped into this, like, litany of questions, right? Maybe he's trying in that little anecdote just to reveal the power of a heart that is tuned into God, of a heart that can see what God 
is doing. And before we think that, that it's because Elijah was just some sort of like supernatural, you know, like prophetic person, right, with the power of God and this like he was just endowed with it. Before we think that, what James illuminates is actually the complete opposite. If anything, he's like, um, so remember that guy, Elijah? Yeah, like, he was so ordinary. Remember him? There's, like, nothing special about him. He says he was a human, just like us. There was nothing, like, special about Elijah. But when Elijah was confronted with a natural reality that was completely out of his control, mind you, he didn't he couldn't control the weather systems, right? What did Elijah do? He prayed. He prayed. And it says he prayed earnestly. He prayed without ceasing. He seemed to be able to see clearly the will of God. And God responded. God responded to this expectant faith. The weather systems like responded to the prayers of Elijah. But Elijah, he's just like you. He's just like me. He's just like us. But when he was confronted with something that he couldn't control, he kept his eyes on God because he knew he was in control. He had vision to see this. The same power that raised Jesus from the grave is the same power that commanded the rain to stop and to start when Elijah prayed. And it's the same power that will either heal the sick on this side of heaven or then raise that person to full life and fully reconcile them on the other side. Either way, God is in control. And our dependency is on God alone. And people who walk in righteousness, who pursue the way of righteousness, they see this. They have vision to see this. Elijah is dropped into the story because he's a great example of an ordinary person who, when committed to doing God's will by knowing God's heart, was able to do the extraordinary, right? Church, there is power. You need to hear this. There is power in being able to pray in accordance with the will of God. When you see God's heart and you see what God is doing, there is power that comes when you pray in accordance with that. But we must let Jesus do diligence with our sin first. We must. There's no way out of the fog outside of Jesus doing diligence with our sin first. It reminds me of what Paul says in the book of Hebrews 12.1. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. In my pastoral words... With this passage in my heart, maybe I would say to our church today, let us confess our sins, get out of the fog, so that we can see Jesus clearly. We can know his heart and do his will together. Let us confess our sins. Let us get out of the fog, right? So that we can see clearly, we can know his heart and do his will together. Amen? So let's bring this home. And I want to get really practical with us today. Because what James is saying to this church, it's the same word for us today. No matter how many iterations of church that has gone before us, the back we should all be standing on is Jesus, right? It's the same back that we want to stand on. So first... Is anyone here among us in trouble this morning? Is anyone here among us in trouble? Is anyone languishing? Your heart, you would say, when I talked about languishing, you're like, ah, I, I, that wasn't just the pandemic. Right? I'm feeling that now, right? Your heart is just heavy. You feel weary. Spiritually, you're like, eh. 
right? Meh. You feel like you're trudging through mud, but you feel like there's no other way to go. You feel like there's nothing you can do about it, and, and you might not even be able to put your finger on why, right? Have you ever been in that place where you're just like, people are like, well, why do you think you feel that way? And you're like, I don't know. Like, I just feel this way, and it's just like, ugh, right? Sometimes it feels laboring to trust in a good God, and we can't even put our finger on why. The word of the Lord to you today is pray. Pray. Turn your attention to the only one who holds the resurrection power for your soul. Transparently, I've kind of been in that place of languishing all week, probably like a month. I don't know if I were, I don't want to go say how far back I could go, but definitely this last week, I've been fighting off a languishing soul. I've been growing weary of the struggle, like the trudging through the mud. But you know what I've been doing all week, and I can say this in all honesty I have been praying. Morning, noon, and night, I have been praying. I've been waking up in the middle of the night praying. I've been waking up in the morning. I've been praying. I've been going on walks after dinner, and I've been praying. I've been eating my lunch, and I've been praying. Every chance I get, I'm talking to God. I'm turning my heart toward the one who can clear the fog for me, to the one who can steady my path. And as I've been praying, as I've been casting my cares on God, as I've been putting God in God's rightful place in my life, through prayer, I can honestly say that I've been able to exchange that which I cannot control for a God who is in control of my life, for a God who never loses control. And truthfully, you know what this has produced in me as the week or the month has gone on? A strong heart. (laughs) Courage, truthfully, as I have prayed, as I've turned my attention toward God, the one who who has the control of my life, I've felt a stronger heart, courage to face some of the things that are just feel so daunting, things that feel scary, things that feel out of my control, which leads me to the next question. Is there anyone here happy today? You're one of those people, right? (laughs) We're glad you're here. Even if you're facing the storms of life, you, you would say, I feel this deep abiding confidence that God is in control and, and God knows how to get you to where you're going, right? You're full of hope today. Your heart feels strong even if you're standing in the mud. The word of the Lord to you today is, and hear this, praise God. Praise God. Turn your attention toward God in humility and give him praise. Because here's the deal. It's not because you're amazing. It's because God is amazing. God is amazing. It's because resurrection power is at work in your life. And by the grace of God, you have the eyes to see it. You have the vision to see the resurrection power in your life in spite of your difficult circumstances if you're facing them, right? So praise God. Praise God. And finally, is there anyone here today who would say, and maybe even if just like in a metaphorical sense, you can go there with me in your imagination, all right? But you would say, I want to pray powerfully and effectively for the sick. So why am I not saying, is there anyone sick here among us today, right? Because I believe that this passage is for those who are in the church and not the one sick laying and waiting for somebody to go to them at home, right? So you would say, as people who are here, able to get here, able-bodied, that I want to pray powerfully and effectively for the sick. I want to experience the power that comes with being attuned to the heart of God and what God is doing. I want that, I hunger that, I crave that. But as I spoke, you said, but if I'm honest, there's some sin that's clouding my vision of seeing God's heart, of knowing what's true. James would say, it's time to come clean. It's time to confess it and get it out. And it's time to let God do what God does. It's time to confess and to let the power the resurrected Jesus from the grave, resurrect all in your life that has been under the power of condemnation and death. 
It's time to let that happen. And that happens through confession. And for all of you private, you know, quiet types in the room, and I'll, I'll be the first one to raise up my hand, uh, sorry, but you can't do this just in the quietness of your own heart. You can't. We are meant to publicly confess. Scripture says you actually have to confess it to someone because public confession, it's an act of declaring, as Scripture says, declaring, confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And for Jesus to be Lord of your life means that the power of condemnation has been broken over your life, that the power of sin and death has been broken, that grace gets to win in you. And grace to, gets to get to work in you. Sometimes it doesn't happen immediately. I'll attest to that. But grace to, gets to get to work in you to begin to clear that fog out so that you can begin to see clearly what God is doing. I can't tell you how much clarity I have had when I have publicly confessed my sins to somebody. I get so much clarity as a result of that when I have yielded my control to Jesus. Please, please don't underestimate the power of public confession in the church. No matter where you find yourself today, though, troubled, happy, sick, in need of grace, I think we all caught, though, that the big idea, the main point, is to fix your eyes on Jesus. Commune with Jesus. Turn your attention toward Jesus. Prayer is the place where heaven and earth overlap. It's where they connect, and it's where God tends to all of, of all of who we are, like all of us, right? Heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's where God tends to all of who we are with the power and the authority of God's kingdom. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. It's where heaven and earth overlap. When we call on the name of the Lord, whether it be in our suffering, whether it be in our gladness or our, our good times, our joy, or even when we call on the name of the Lord in other people's suffering, heaven collides with us. Heaven opens up to us. Prayer is where we stand before Jesus and we yield. Whatever there is to do, Lord, do it. Only you can do it. And Christians are people that are called into this overlapping space where heaven meets earth. That's where the Christian community lives. That's where they get their culture and their identity is in that little overlapping, intersecting space. This is the space that James was pulling this church into. We are an ordinary people to, meant to do extraordinary things because we are a people who are meant to see clearly what God is doing in the world and to partner with that. And there is power in that. There is power when we pray in accordance with the, with the will of God. We know what God is doing. We are a people who know that the power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that confronts all of our sin and all of our shame head on. And it wins every single time. We are a people that have vision to see that. And this, my friends, is the single greatest way we mature as a people who are committed to the kingdom breaking in in our lives. Amen. Amen. It's true. It's true. So I'm going to close in prayer, but this is the invitation for you today. We're going to have some of our elders and some of our pastors, which are really the same thing, synonymous, synonymous up here, and we're going to be here to receive you, to stand with you in prayer. I think that there is a lot of power that comes when we do this together. And there is power that comes when, when people come and partner with you in that space where God is ministering to your life. And so first, if, if there's somebody that would say, like, I'm languishing. I'm, I'm the person in trouble. 
I want you to come and I want you to receive prayer. I want you to take a step in faith and to turn your eyes toward Jesus and say, I'm turning all that languishing toward you, God, and I'm going to trust that you're in control and that you're going to do what only you can do in me. I can't get out of this. I can't get out of this. There's no way but through, but I'm going to ask you to come and be present with me in what I'm experiencing right now. If you're, if you're in a place where you're, you're feeling strong of heart, we want to come and we want to pray God's like increase of that, that God would just protect that and continue to give you vision to see what God is doing, that God would give you resilience and joy sometimes even in the midst of suffering. We want to bless that courage that you're experiencing. I could actually name a couple of names, which I won't because I didn't ask you, in the room right now where I would say, oh, you are the happy one right now. And I know it's not because your life is easy, but I see that you're seeing what God is doing and you're partnering with God there and you're feeling courageous and you're feeling strong of heart. There's a couple of you that I even know when I look at you right now that that's where you are. We want to pray blessing, just more of that, God. Protection, provision. And then if there's anybody that would say, I, I just need to confess some stuff today. All the people up here, we know how to be present with that. There's nothing that you could say that's going to shock us. <laughs> We're not here to counsel you. We're here to partner with the Holy Spirit and the story of freedom that you are being invited into. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to shame you. We're not here to correct you. We're here to partner with the Holy Spirit in what God wants to set free in your life. And there's power in that confession. And we want to pray a blessing over you to be able to pray powerfully and effectively as you confess your sin, okay? We also have oil up here. And if you allow us to, we want to anoint you with oil. And, and hear me when I say there's nothing magical about the oil. The oil is symbolic of our faith, all the pastors that will be up here today, our faith and our expectation that God can do in you what you can't do for yourself. And there are things in the natural, that in your life right now can't be done. You're completely depending on God to do them. And so we want to anoint you with oil as an act of consecrating you, as setting you apart for the attention and the care of God alone. So if you let us do that, we want to do that, okay? And so let's pray. And I would say if you, um, if you fall into any one of those categories, I'm going to go ahead and bite up... Um, our pastors, if you fall into any one of those categories, come and come quickly. Uh, don't delay. Resurrection power is here today, and that's a wonderful op opportunity for us to receive. It's a wonderful gift for us to get to experience this morning. So come and come quickly, and we're going to stay here as long as we need to. We don't need to rush. We don't need to go anywhere, um, but we're going we're gonna to pray, and then uh, I will formally close the service in a few minutes. Let's pray. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you once again at this point in our journey together this morning. God, you have been faithful so far every moment of our time together. And the God who has been faithful will continue to prove faithful as we now take this next step of trust and obedience. So I want to bless you, church take hold of the things that God has for you today, that, that you can have the expectation that you don't have to leave the same way that you came today, because the power of God and the presence of God is on your side and is ready to move in your life. And so I bless you with courage, and I bless you with faith, and I bless you with trust to respond to the Holy Spirit whatever God is prompting in your life. And even if there's something that you would say, I don't even know what it is. I just want to get prayer. I just want to, I want to be set apart for the spirit of God to pay attention to me, to tend to me. I bless you with the courage to say yes to that prompting. God, you are with us and you are for us. Your banner over us is love. And so we welcome that. We welcome. So 
come and receive.